hey, welcome. And I don't know if you're going to cut that and bonus it or put there's it gonna, at the end. There's going to be something really fun at the end. Yeah. You should stick around because we yeah. just chatted for two and a half minutes about something that was fun and mildly related. We, we could relate that to martial arts. We're not going to. If you want to save that for the next word association, yeah. you could do that. But hey, you, you out there in the audience, whether you're watching, which we hope you are, or listening, which most of you do, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, joined by my good friend, co-host, producer, uh, video editor, video editor, event co-promoter, and handsome, handsome man, Andrew Adams. That's Thank me. You. That is you. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you being here. And on today's episode, we're going to follow up an episode that we did a couple months ago. A couple months ago, as the point that this releases, where we talked about when is it time to step away from your martial arts school? And we're going to kind of flip this. I don't know. If, was this audience feedback? Uh, actually, uh, Kelly Thomas okay. said, maybe you guys do an episode on this. All right. Shout out to Kelly, one of our Whistlekick Alliance members with her with her school TKD kicks as as well as just often supporter she's she's a wonderful person she's become a great friend pose the question what about when is it time to ask a student to leave a much more difficult and emotional yep. situation so we're going to dig into that today stick around what would you do does it line up with what we're going to talk about hmm we'll find out in a moment if you're new to what we do, welcome. Thank you for joining us. A couple things you might want to consider doing. Head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com where we have every episode, including transcripts. We have a place you can play the episode, watch the episode right there. And you can you can find all the episodes we've ever done. This is 900 and something or whatever. 930-ish. Sure. I don't know. 932 probably, I think. We'll see. Don't quote us on that. You, you can already tell wherever you are watching or listening to this. <laughs> you know what episode, you know what episode number this is better than we do. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you might also consider heading to whistlekick.com. Why? Because what we do is so much more than a martial arts podcast. We are more than the top ranked traditional martial arts podcast in the world. We are also an event company and a product company and a training program company and even more than that. So check out whistlekick.com. If there's something there you want to buy, Almost everything's available at a 15% discount with the code PODCAST15. And that helps us pay bills because you know what? Nothing's free. Absolutely. So let's, let's, talk, let's dig in. Mm -hmm. Let's set the scene, not with a specific, but with some generalities. And we can mm -hmm. work to specifics. So that's usually what we do on this show. The premise here that we're working through is that there is a student who is not a fit for your martial arts program mm -hmm. and they have not chosen to remove themselves, right? Quite often when it's not a fit, the student or the parents of the student recognize that it's not a fit and they'll make the choice. <clears throat> yep. I would say most often that happens, but Be not always. Most often, I would agree. And it happens most often because of one very strong belief that is commonly held by most martial arts instructors I know. The students that are most difficult in class are the ones that need what I offer the most. Mm -hmm. The disruptive child most needs the discipline and the structure of being in that class. That that class provides. Sure. The adult that talks out of turn or creates drama is the one that most needs community and support that comes from being in class. Unfortunately, there are circumstances where you're not going to be able to help this person solve their problems. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they're unwilling to step away. Or they're unwilling to have their problems solved. Unwilling, unable. Yep. Right. Yep. There, there's something going on. Mm -hmm. And I would say in, I think I can confidently say in every case, one thing is happening that, that triggers this. And it has to do with how the student's behavior 
is impacting the other students. The other students, yeah. That that's the for me. That's one of not the only, but one of the biggest things that I go to is that if if a student is impacting another student's ability to learn, uh, that's a huge problem. Now, of course, that's a spectrum. That's not binary yep, yep. because in every class you have students that need more attention than others, mm -hmm. and you can't expect that. Every single student is going to get the exact same amount of time and attention in every class. And if someone needs a little more, well, I'm booting them out. That, that's not what we're talking about. Yeah. There's a threshold. And I'm thinking back to there was a student when I had my school like, first time. So we're going back a couple decades. There was a, a student who came and, and I knew the dad. And so the parents brought the son. He was seven, eight and was chaotic mm. and and we agreed you know this might not be a fit let's see what happens and fortunately we were in agreement that the group setting was not a fit for him but i other if they had di disagreed or if they'd not seen that i would have absolutely that child would not have gotten a second class mm. with me at that time and what we decided to do was, just as an aside, we decided to one-on-one. -on -one. Sure. And in the hope that we could build up enough structure and skill and trust with me that we could get him back, back into, into other people in, yeah. in, into the class. But I've heard plenty of stories. You've probably heard them too, where parents don't care. Yeah. They see martial arts as... A babysitting yeah, program. A and drop, for some a drop, of, off, drop off daycare. For some of them, uh, they see it as a low cost mm -hmm. daycare. Yeah. Because let's face it, how, how, how much does, does daycare cost? It's a fortune, right? Yeah. We, we, I think anybody who's even adjacent to that industry knows that. How many people have you known that have been asked to leave? I could probably, I'd have to think about it, but it would, I, I could count them all on one hand. Yeah, it's a small number. Yeah. I'm thinking of one, and, and I don't want to give details on the story because it's not my story, but I'm thinking of one there. Um, I've never personally, I've been fortunate, had to ask someone to leave. Now, there have been people that have kind of ridden that line, mm -hmm. and they've all, the, the where I've placed them, you know, if they're online, I've put them somewhere. The reason that they're there is because they're so dramatically compromising the experience for others in the room. Yep. Yeah. The, the instances, <clears throat> excuse me, that I know of were the same. They were affecting either other students and the safety of other students mm -hmm. Um, and then one was actually a parent that was asked to not come back. Your child was still welcome and you can drop them off, but you need to stay outside. I just had a conversation with, uh, with a school owner who had, and I'm, I'm going to make sure I use no details here because again, not my story to tell, but very, very high drama. Mm -hmm. We'll just leave it at that. <clears throat> and... On the... When it's kids, we're talking about disruptive behavior that detracts mm -hmm. from others. When we're yep. talking about adults, it usually has to do with high drama that they're not willing to leave at the door. High drama or safety. Well, the, the safety usually comes from the drama. In, in, uh, no? No, I no, don't. Not your experience? I, not, I, don't, I would say often, but I would not. Certainly okay. not always. Okay. Because um, when, when, I, when I think about the safety stuff, Right? It's, it's quite common. Anybody out there who, who's, who's been around a while knows it's really common if you get an, a, a larger, like a physically larger in stature, mm -hmm. adult man joining class. They're used to using their strength as an asset, and it can be mm -hmm. really difficult to get them. Not that it's malicious, in, sure, sure. but they just they struggle. Right. The, I've, I've always been able to find a way to accommodate that. And yep. it's, you know, okay, you're going to work with me until you can soften up. Sure. And, and that, but that's different. 
But right. when you have a student, and there I know is an example in a school that I was in, so I feel comfortable telling the sure, story, please. Um, who refused to spar. And we just did, you know, point sparring with, you know, head headgear and phone gear and stuff like that, but refused to go light. And no matter how much the instructor told them, mm. you're, you're sparring with a, a yellow belt and you're a black belt. Like, <clears throat> you need to go lighter with them. Well, they're not going to learn anything. No, you need to go lighter and refused basically to do so. Would say, okay, but would do it for one or two people and then get to the third person and they get ramped up and would continually spar mm -hmm. way too hard and was eventually asked to leave because he started affecting everyone else's ability people to learn. People didn't want to be there. They didn't want to, they didn't want to with partner with him yeah. and uh, it became unsafe. Yeah. You know what else I hear in that story? Hmm. How did he get a black belt? Well, he did not get a black belt from our school. But he got a black belt from You're somebody. Right. Absolutely. So yep. some he yeah. earned a black belt from somebody and they overlooked that. And so I, that, that's why, you know, when we talk about some of these things, that's why culture and making sure that your students are, are not just physically skilled, but uh, uh, able to embody the lessons of martial arts is yep. so, so important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I am. I'm trying to think I've dealt with people like this, but one of the things that I, I think I forget is that through most of my time in training, despite being smaller, I have been more skilled than most people on the floor. Mm -hmm. So if I'm dealing with somebody like that, I can usually say, okay, either you need to dial it back mm -hmm. or we're going to go at your pace and I'm better at going at your pace than you are and you're yeah. not going to enjoy it. Uh, and that unfortunately works. But I'm th there are other people. I'm thinking of someone, uh, I think I've told you the story, I won't give the details, someone in an organization that I'm part of um, was a bully and was known to be a bully. Interesting, yeah. And was kind of ignored for being a bully for whatever reason. So it's, we're talking, really it's coming down to, to two results. It's safety, mm -hmm. compromising the experience of other students and it's disruption, yeah. compromising class, the, 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 the ability of other students to learn. To learn, yeah. Yep, I would agree. And I think there has to be, I don't think it can be a black and white. I think we both would agree. Yeah. It's not like, oh, this person, just, this person disrupted class the first time. Oh, get out. I mean, obviously, you know, when, when the person that I was speaking of that, that was sparring too hard, wasn't like the first time it happened to that like he was spoken to multiple times um and when it was obvious after a month or so that he was not going to change that that was when a conversation was had that this yeah. it looks like it's not the right school for you yeah. it, we mentioned the third one we kind of glossed over is is the drama right mm -hmm. you know maybe yep. maybe uh parents causing problems on the side or yep. saying you know harassing instructors, my child, you know, why did that child, right? You mm -hmm. know, we, we've, we've heard stories about that stuff. But if we add all three of those, if we take what's common to those three, it's someone or someone's, maybe it's a family, negatively impacting the experience of others yep. and you don't see it getting better. Yeah. I, I think that's the key. That it's was not going to get better. That was the issue we had with a parent who he the the both parents would come and bring the child, and the mother was fine, but the father would often come in smelling of alcohol, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to say they were drunk because I'm I have no legal ability to know that, but he was very disruptive during class. He would sit off the side and be like. Why is he doing it that way? And would yell to his son, hey, and I'm not going to use the name, hey, person, like, do it like him. He's doing it so much better than you. And it's like, um, let me teach a class. Yeah. And Sounds like he probably was drunk. Perhaps. Um, but when this happened multiple days, uh, they were eventually told, we would, we would still love to have your child in class. Uh, and if you would like your wife to come in and sit and watch class, that's fine. But we're going to need you to, to, to stay outside. Yeah. And I assume that wasn't the first communication on the subject. Uh, absolutely. It was not. Yeah, for sure. 
we expect as martial artists, as martial arts instructors, we expect that people get better. And the, and the moment someone's not going to get better, that's where it, issues come up, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> Students will choose to leave often when they don't see themselves getting better, right? You get that hole at, at just before black belt, mm -hmm. you know, it, someone's in there because the length of time between rank, which is how they've identified that they're getting better. Shout out to schools that find ways to motivate people without rank, because that's not the only way, nor is it the best way. Um, they bail mm -hmm. because they end up in that, that spot for a year or two and they're, they're going, well, I don't know I'm getting better. They don't see the progress so they're, they're investing time, energy, and money and not seeing a result. Mm -hmm. It breaks the equation. That's a fundamental equation for us as human beings, that we need to see something on either side of the equal sign. As instructors, and, and honestly, as students, I've been in plenty of classes with disruptive people, people who go too hard. Mm -hmm. But when I see that they're getting better, it changes everything. Yeah. When I can see light at the end of the tunnel, I'm willing to give it more time. Sure. Yeah. And I think the only other aspect of this we haven't touched on is, and there are certainly ways to, to go about it, but financial reasons. Um, mm. If a you have a student that, and there are ways to work around this, but sure. uh, the scenario is you charge X number of dollars a month to teach, and this student has not paid for X number of months. You know, maybe you've had a discussion with them, and you know, I'm not telling you as an instructor how to handle this situation. Um, you know, in our school, we usually try and work something out with them. But uh, if you are a school owner that needs to be you know, financially paid by every single student, maybe that is a reason that you ask them to leave as well. It's not one I would personally do. Well, it, I would, it I would depends on ways. why they're not paying. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so mm -hmm. if we, now if we, we kind of collect all that together, we can express it in a different way. It's people not meeting your instructor school expectations of them. Mm -hmm. You are expected to do certain things. You're expected to show up probably on time, probably in a clean uniform, probably ready to learn, probably having paid your dues, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? Whatever the things are. And if you consistently violate those conditions and you do not show that you are making efforts to correct that behavior and the violations are significant enough to the instructor, then it's time for them to leave. Yeah. Right? Now, here's the piece that I think we need to remember. This is a really important piece. And, and I've, I've said this, and this is something that I, I think some instructors are going to struggle to hear. There is no one student that is more important than the rest of your students. I don't care how much that student needs you. Because if you continue to accommodate poor behavior that is in violation of whatever expectations you have set of them, you will be left with only that student. Mm -hmm. As martial arts instructors, we have a gift and a responsibility. I've thought a lot about this. I posted this on Facebook a couple of weeks ago. Martial arts instructors have a duty to share what we have with as many people as possible. Or what, how did I say it? To reach as many students as possible. Yeah. There, there are plenty of, there's plenty of opportunity for subject, subjectivity in there. Put that aside for a moment. The needs of the one, the needs of the many. If you allow your student, one student, to not pay their dues and everybody else finds out about it, it's not good. Mm -hmm. Maybe they stop paying or maybe they resent that person and it affects your culture. There's no good that comes of that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> maybe you have a student that's incredibly disruptive and continues to disrupt. And if it's a child, the parents don't do anything about it. Or if it's an adult, they don't show up. 
better prepared or whatever it is. It, your tolerance of that is a signal to your other students that the rules you set are unimportant. It's not just about what you know and how well you can teach. It's how well what you teach is received by the majority. So I think if you consider any scenario through that lens and, yeah. and these various things we've put together here, it becomes pretty obvious when it's time for someone to leave. The question is, are you going to pull the trigger? Mm. And we know that most people have a hard time doing that yeah. because we love teaching, mm -hmm. because we value our students, because we want to reach them, <clears throat> but also because a lot of us are scared of causing conflict and we have a hard time ending Things. How many people are in bad marriages, bad relationships that they know do not serve them and everybody would be better if they ended things, but they don't do it. Yeah. I think that was a good and balanced Absolutely. approach to the subject. Yeah. But we want to know what you think. Reach out to us, Andrew at Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. Join the Facebook group page, the Facebook page. We retired the group. Yeah. Martial Arts Radio. Let us know. You can email us. You can find us. We, we post this stuff on social media, at Whistlekick everywhere. We want to know what you think. And specifically what I want to know. And if you've got to share this privately, totally fine. I want to know when you have kicked students out. And I want to know why. Or if you, you're not the instructor, when a student was kicked out. I want more examples of this because I think mm. between the two of us, we have less than a dozen. Yeah, uh, for sure. I've got less than five. And so hearing more from all of you helps us kind of round that out and see, is there an exception to what we've laid out that we didn't consider? That's what I'm most interested in. Yeah, that'd be good. All right. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you. We appreciate all of your continued support in our efforts to connect, educate, and entertain the martial artists of the world. Help us help all of you. Until next time. Train hard. Smile. And have, have a great, great day. day. Yay. Yay. We're good at this. Yeah. We should keep doing it. Okay. Let's keep going. All right. All right. I am self-conscious of creating any kind of percussive sound when Around you're in the room. <laughs> there are times, like, you were out, you were getting the plant, and I was here, and I was just kind of drumming along, and I was like, Andrew's going to hear me. <laughs> I'm off beat. I'm and, sure I'm off. Beat. And he's going to judge me. He's going to judge me horrendously. <laughs> it won't happen. It's fine. Do you find, do you have challenge with just percussive noise in the world because it's close to drumming? Like if you hear something that is somewhat harmonic, but not quite perfectly no, cadenced? No, not really. No. I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, but you, you hear percussive stuff. Right. All, everywhere. In fact, I encourage you, if you have not seen it, uh, a great movie called Tap, or maybe it's Taps, I don't, Tap or Taps, I don't remember, okay. with Gregory Hines. Okay. And it's, tap, it's a tap dancing movie. But he goes out on the street and listens to the, he's in New York City. Sure. And he hears the percussive stuff of everything. And he dances and, to and it? Da and that he's like, really he hears, cool. you hear, and he's teaching, it, there's one scene in it where he's taking a group of his students, of some tap people around. It's like, you know, and the big thing was like, his dad was a famous, mm -hmm. famous tap dancer in the movie. Not, not, I don't know that in real life, but <clears throat> he was like, you know, you hear that, you know, there's a, a car driving by a piece of metal and it makes a sound. He's like, Oh, you know, I hear this one I hear. And he like tap dances it out. It's a brilliant movie. That really, sounds, really, really good. That's really interesting. And if you, it, it, you don't have to be into tap to enjoy the movie. It's a great movie. But if you are into tap dancing, Gregory Hines is, is in it. Sammy Davis, Jr. Arthur Duncan, Tim Ash, like all of these famous tap dance, like old school tap dance people are in yeah. it. Yeah, back when when <clears throat> actors were, they could act and sing and dance, yeah. and they were they were multifaceted. Yeah, great, great, really good movie. Highly check it out. But anyway, that has nothing to do with our episode.